much time to study. Yeah, we can start. Okay, and I'll share my screen. Okay, thank you, Max and uh, Giovanni, for, for the invitation. Um, the, um, so this masterclass is uh, called the Free Energy Calculations for Crystalline Solids Using the Environment Similarity uh, CV. Uh, I'm Pablo Piaggi. Uh, so let's start with the class. And uh, since it is a class, I will start with uh, uh, something basic. Uh, so um, the concept of uh, thermodynamic equilibrium of uh, several phases and the chemical potentials from a thermodynamic perspective. So uh, if we consider uh, two phases, uh, alpha uh, and beta, um, uh, phase alpha is at a temperature at the alpha, pressure P alpha, and chemical potential mu alpha, and we have the respective quantities for uh, the phase uh, beta. Now, if we allow them to um, exchange energy volume and molecules, um, we can uh, try to understand the thermodynamic equilibrium between them by writing the, uh, the free energy uh, of, uh, of the process of, of this exchange. And uh, what we see in this equation is that the conditions for uh, equilibrium of these two phases will be that the temperature must be equal, the pressure must be equal, and the chemical potentials must be equal. So these are the conditions for thermal, mechanical, and chemical equilibrium. And um, of course, imbalance of a temperature, pressure, or chemical potential will lead to energy volume uh, or mass transfer. Now, uh, assuming that, uh, uh, that thermal and mechanical equilibrium is satisfied, the central property that we will need to understand is um, the chemical potentials of, uh, of each phase. Now, uh, let's consider the chemical potentials from the point of view of statistical mechanics. The definition of the chemical potential uh, at some temperature T and pressure P is the derivative of the uh, Gibbs free energy with respect to the number of particles. The Gibbs free energy is uh, uh, defined uh, via the partition function C here. And the partition function is, as usual, an integral overall um, uh, upon the volume of the configuration space and an appropriate Boltzmann factor. This is the typical uh, equations that one finds in, uh, in books. And the comment that I have about this is that these expressions are only useful if you're considering phases at equilibrium and in the thermodynamic limit. And the reason is that, um, well, one way to see why this is the case is that if we rewrite the partition function as a sum of a, over some collective coordinate S uh, and some per atom free energy surface G of S. What we can see is that if the free energy surface has two basins, say one for alpha and one for beta as a function of this uh, collective variable, what we have is that, um, well, consider for instance, uh, uh, the ensemble average of an observable. This is uh, much like in the partition function an integral over the S with uh, here the, uh, the observable as a function of S. And the key insight is that uh, when N tends to infinity, so in the thermodynamic limit, the minimum, the minimum free energy basin here alpha will dominate uh, the integral and the basin beta will have no, no influence. However, in finite systems, we'll have that both basins uh, will uh, contribute to, to the integral. So from this point of view, these equations make more sense in the thermodynamic limit that for finite systems where there is some mixing between the uh, um, the contributions of uh, the phases to, to ensemble averages. Uh, furthermore, um, this type of equation makes sense only in equilibrium um, because when n tends to uh, to infinity, we will always choose the basin with a, a, a minimum free energy, and we will completely uh, neglect a, a beta. Um, so the issue with these equations is that we often would like to compute uh, chemical potentials for phases that are metastable, such as beta, and we just said that um, the integral defined in this way will lose the information about beta. 
And furthermore, we typically in molecular simulations deal with uh, finite systems, um, and this will be also an issue. Okay, so I would argue that a better definition uh, for the chemical potentials of individual phases in this context is given by the following expressions. What I have written here is the uh, Gibbs free energy of phase alpha. This is uh, the number of uh, atoms times uh, the chemical potential uh, of phase alpha. And uh, here we have the integral uh, over the Boltzmann factor, but restricted to the uh, configurations that correspond to the phase alpha. And we can do a similar definition for uh, phase beta. And uh, here the point is that we would like to compute these quantities, so mu alpha and mu beta, from our simulations. OK. So the definition of these uh, uh, volumes of a configuration space that belong to each phase can be easily defined if we have some collective variable for which we can say if the collective variable is less than some, um, some threshold uh, S star, then that's alpha. And if the S is larger than this threshold, um, the, um, all those configurations correspond to beta. So uh, the procedure of identifying uh, the regions of configuration space that belong to one phase or another one uh, is, of course, greatly simplified if we have a good order parameter that, um, that can be used in this fashion. Um, importantly, these definitions, the one that I wrote here, that are the ones that I, we're going to use, work well even if alpha and beta are metastable. Um, and to make some connections with, uh, the, um, in general, the, uh, the, the um, thermodynamics of, uh, of materials and the, the uh, plots that one typically sees in, in books of uh, thermodynamics of materials, um, what I'm showing here is the chemical potential as a function of temperature. And you see that, uh, so below, below some uh, transition temperature, alpha is more stable, and above the transition temperature, beta becomes more stable. So the fact that we have these equations allows us to calculate for a particular phase, say alpha, uh, the chemical potential at all temperatures, even when it is, when it is metastable. We can also uh, draw the uh, entropy, that is the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to temperature. Um, and we can see clearly uh, the, well, that they are different at the, um, at the melting temperature. But what I would like to highlight here is that if we use, use just the uh, typical expression that, uh, that I showed before found in, uh, in books of statistical mechanics, what we can get is only the equilibrium behavior that I'm showing here in black that it traces the, the minimum free energy of all phases as a function of temperature. And we clearly see here in uh, the entropy, the discontinuity. OK, so now that we have set the scene um, for a, like, um, to do the actual calculations and to define the, uh, the mean of the, these chemical potentials, I would like to go into the idea of collective variables and how uh, we can use them um, to, to study or to calculate chemical potentials uh, in real materials. The plot that I'm showing here is, uh, has in the x-axis one um, collective variable that is a rotational invariant. That is to say, it is not sensitive to changes in rotation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the structure. And we have also a symmetry breaking order parameter that is something that is um, that it can describe the uh, structure in different orientations. And uh, the free energy landscape that we see uh, here has the liquid um, in this region, that is when both order parameters have low values. And we have uh, um, for large values of the rotational invariant uh, order parameter and uh, low values of the symmetry breaking one, we have solids that are misaligned with the box and therefore will have defects um, or uh, residual stresses, for instance. And instead, when both um, processes, I mean, with both collective variables increase simultaneously, we have the solid that is, that is well aligned with the box. That is typically what we try to get because this will have no defects and no stresses. 
And the purpose of this slide is to um, show that we have to strive to get um, the, uh, the crystallization along this, um, this line, that is to say, just to study the liquid and the perfect, perfect solid. That is to say, a solid that is well aligned uh, with the box. Okay, so um, a lot of work has been done to determine rotational invariant order parameters, but not so much uh, to determine symmetry breaking order parameters. And what I, I mean, the core topic of this uh, uh, talk is actually the definition of a symmetry breaking order parameter or collective variable. That is what I will introduce next. Okay, and this is the uh, environment similarity uh, kernel. Uh, that is something that uh, is based uh, loosely on the uh, on the ideas of uh, um, Bartok and Gaborciani, uh, and we have uh, developed them a bit further in this context with uh, with Michele Parinello. Um, okay, so the starting point for uh, the definition of this uh, um, similarity between environments is a broadened atomic density uh, of species alpha around some environment chi. Chi is the environment around uh, uh, a given atom. Okay, so we define the density of species alpha in this environment chi as a sum of uh, Gaussians. So this uh, in the limit would, would be delta functions, but we choose some broadening parameter uh, sigma um, to construct this density. Now that we have this density, uh, we can uh, define a non-rotationally invariant kernel um, and the purpose of this kernel is to compare, compare environments chi and some reference environment chi zero. And this is the definition of the, of the kernel. Okay, uh, now just for reference, I'm showing the uh, rotational invariant uh, SOAP kernel. This is uh, the, what has been introduced by Bartok, Condor, and, and Chani. So the two kernels are essentially the same. They differ in the fact that the soap kernel is defined in such a way that it is um, rotational invariant by integrating all, over all possible uh, rotations. Here we don't have such an integration; it's not needed, which will will greatly simplify you know, the the expressions. Plus, uh, we also have uh, some powers here too, and here I'm uh, in general uh, writing n. The issue with the soap kernel is that. Uh, one has to choose something greater than one, so at least two, in order not to lose uh, all angular information. Because if one chooses one here, um, the two integrals can be um, uh, exchanged, and essentially one loses all angular information. Uh, this is not the case for the non-rotational invariant kernel. And uh, as a matter of fact, we can use that. It's very simple. It will it will be very uh, very accurate as well. Um, and it will retain only uh, two body terms, which is okay. Okay, now uh, we can substitute this broad and the definition of the broad and density that we have uh, in the uh, in the expression for the kernel. So here we put the expression for the uh, density, and what we get is um, after doing the disintegration analytically is this expression that has. Uh, a sum uh, over alpha, a sum over all the atoms in environment uh, chi uh, of species alpha, and uh, well, the same sum over all atoms uh, j um, over an environment uh, chi zero, that's a reference environment restricted to the, um, the species alpha. Okay, so this is the kernel. It's quite uh, uh, simple, actually, despite the perhaps the, uh, the formal uh, derivation. <clears throat> As I said before, there are only two body terms, and it scales, I think, um, in a in a good way. Um, it um, it scales with the number of atoms in the environment chi zero times the number of atoms in the environment chi, which is roughly the uh, number of atoms that we have in a in a reference environment. And I will show what a reference environments look like uh, shortly. Um, <clears throat> okay. And uh, another issue that, uh, that we have to uh, consider before moving forward is the fact that it would be useful to normalize the kernel such that it has values between zero and one, at least approximately. And this can be done in two ways. 
There is the symmetric normalization, which I would say is the preferred one. Here we have the kernel. So the, say the dis distance between a reference environment chi zero and environment chi. And this is divided by uh, this normalization. And this uh, preserves the symmetry property uh, of the kernel. This is the, the one that is typically used in machine le learning applications. I'm not going to use that one. And the reason is um, straightforward, is that we will have to calculate derivatives of these quantities. And if we calculate derivatives of, um, um, uh, of the symmetric kernel, um, they will be much more expensive. So what we can do that will be cheaper is uh, do a non-symmetric normalization in which we just divide by the distance uh, of environment uh, chi zero, the reference environment with itself. This is going to be uh, faster than this one, especially when you need derivatives, as I said before. Okay, so this is by and large the, uh, the, um, the, the uh, underpinnings of, uh, of this environment similarity kernel. So now uh, to make the topic a bit less abstract. So how do environments uh, look like? And here I'm showing the environments for a BCC Brave lattice. This is a very simple lattice. So we have one environment because there's only one atom in the basis of, the, uh, of this crystal structure. And uh, for instance, if we choose 14 uh, neighbors around a uh, uh, given atom, this is how the, uh, the environment looks like. This is in perspective. If we choose a slightly larger environment, we have something like what I'm showing here, and this is the same in perspective. And an even larger environment with 50 atoms looks like this, and uh, here's in perspective. This is a relatively simple crystal structure, yet we can choose uh, these uh, uh, different uh, environments in order to, to define it. Now, uh, one thing that I would like to stress is that, so this, uh, um, environment similarity kernel will give us one value uh, per atom. So if we consider one phase, uh, for instance, say the liquid or the solid, we'll have distributions of this, uh, of this quantity. Here I'm showing the distribution uh, of the liquid in blue and the distribution of the solid in, um, in orange. Um, so we have uh, per atom quantities, uh, but we would like to build global collective variables so we will um, build a collective variable S of the atomic coordinates R as a function of all these per atom quantities. Here we have uh, that we evaluated the kernel with respect to the uh, reference environment for some environment chi one, say that can correspond to atom number one in the simulation box. We do the same for atom number two, the same for atom number N. The typical functions that we will use, and in fact, we will use this in the tutorial, are the mean of, uh, of uh, these uh, values or the number of solid-like atoms defined to the condition that uh, these, um, <clears throat> the, the kernel values should be larger than some threshold. And in this case, say the threshold could be around here, 0 0.5. But of course, we will not use a, a strict threshold because in that case, um, we would have the issue that um, the collective variable would, variable would not be uh, continuous and differentiable. So what we actually use is some kind of switching function uh, that is zero for small uh, values of the kernel and uh, one for uh, values that are, um, say, larger than 0 0.5 and um, uh, changes smoothly in between these uh, uh, zero and one. So that's the definition that we will use for the number of solid-like atoms in the simulation box. Okay, so um, this is uh, uh, already in bloom. So this uh, uh, this development and uh, this is the the the, the syntax uh, that one has to use to um, to get the kernel values in uh, in bloom. So we have here the broadening parameter sigma. And I will discuss later how to choose this appropriately. We have the definition of the crystal structure that in this case is very simple. It's just BCC and we choose some lattice constant. This automatically will give us the, uh, the environments that have 14 uh, neighbors, which are the standard BCC uh, and nearest neighbors uh, uh, environments. 
And we will also have to choose the global parameters that we compute. And here we compute the mean and the more than using some switching function. So this is the, the typical syntax that we will use. Okay, so now I would like to describe uh, something that we will not use in the tutorial, but uh, I think it's very useful uh, to understand the generality of, uh, of uh, these concepts. And it's the, um, how we define the environment similarity kernel for crystal structures that have more than one atom uh, in their basis. So if there are M atoms in the basis of a crystal structure, we'll have M reference environments. We will um, denote them by a chi1, chi2, chi m. And what we will do is we will calculate the uh, kernel value for all reference environments and just pick the largest, which makes sense because we're trying to compare environments. We just pick the one that has the best agreement. So here we have the, um, we're computing the kernel using as reference the first uh, environment. And we compute this for a given environment. We repeat it for all um, reference environments up to uh, the environment um, uh, chi m. And we just pick the largest. Of course, this is also not continuous and differentiable. And in order to do that, we have to use a, like a soft max function. This is the one that it's um, programmed directly in the um, in Bloom. Now, uh, you can see that the calculation will become more expensive if we have a, a more complex crystal structures with, um, say, with M uh, reference environments. And in this case, the uh, calculation would scale as before times the number of environments um, that we have in, the, in our crystal structure. <clears throat> now, again, how do environments look like in cases where we have many environments? Um, or I mean, at least more than one that defines the crystal structure. And here I'm showing the environments in different phases of ice, and you can see how rich um, these environments can be. So in the case of uh, ice 1H, we have only four reference environments, and that are the ones I'm showing here. But if you consider ice 5, we have uh, 28 uh, reference environments that I have tried to, uh, to illustrate in this, uh, uh, in this image. And you can really see the complexity of the of these structures, um, and yet you can also see the fact that um, we have a general framework even to tackle um, uh, crystalline solids that have a, a very complex unit cells uh, with um, many many molecules or atoms per per unit cell. <clears throat> Okay, so in this case, we're in, where we have a, more than one reference environment, uh, and perhaps the crystal structure has not been coded uh, directly in Plume. And the way that we, so the input will look like the one that I'm showing here. And again, we have the broadening parameter sigma. We have uh, the crystal structure that now is defined as custom uh, because it's not one of the uh, BCC or FCC, the ones that, uh, the typical ones that are, are already coded. Um, and when we choose a custom crystal structure, what we have to do is we have to provide the reference environments. And these are provided using uh, PDB files, very standardized. In this case, we have four reference environments for, uh, for hexagonalize. And uh, again, we have to choose some global parameters that are constructed from the uh, kernels uh, for each um, for each atom in the simulation box. So one of the exercises that uh, I'm proposing in the tutorials is uh, um, how, to, um, how to choose the broadening parameter uh, sigma. And here I'm explaining how I suggest to do it. That I think is a very rational and systematic way to choose the, the parameter sigma. So what we do is we define the overlap between the liquid and the solid distribution, or in general, between any two phases that we are studying. So we will have uh, the distribution, say, P of X in the solid and Q of X in the liquid. And we define the overlap in this way. Of having less overlap, it's better because we are able to uh, discriminate between the, the two structures that we're dealing with um, more precisely. 
So we calculate the overlap versus sigma, so the broadening parameter of the kernels. And what we find, here's the example for, uh, for all the phases of ice that we studied in, in this paper, is that the uh, overlap always has a minimum as a function of sigma. And the, of course, the rational way to choose it is to just pick the sigma that minimizes the overlap between the distributions. Um, and this is the way that I recommend uh, choosing sigma. And this is the first uh, exercise in the tutorial. I suggest that you do it uh, in the case of sodium. Okay, so um, another thing that uh, uh, it's very important is how do we choose uh, environments? And what I'm showing here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, movie is uh, the use of a tool called Environment Finder that I built precisely for this. So given a crystal structure, what are the environments that we need to use for our CV? And what you do here is you choose whatever structure you're interested in. You choose the, um, um, the types of atoms and that, uh, that um, we will be dealing with, the cutoff. And this will automatically determine which are the um, unique environments that exist in the, uh, in the structure. And we'll also give you the opportunity to visualize the environments, as I'm showing here, and uh, the PDB uh, files that you need to use as input. Um, so I would say with this tool, together with the rational choice of Sigma, um, one can build essentially uh, environments and collective variables for any, any crystal structure. And here you have the, uh, the information of uh, where to find this, uh, um, this app that, that you can use. Okay, so and uh, now that uh, we know the collective variable that that uh, we will use, um, I will describe the uh, exercise that I propose to do in the uh, in the tutorial. And what I propose to do is um, so test different uh, methods to calculate liquid solid chemical potential differences, which is how I started the talk. Now, so why chemical potentials are important and how to define chemical potentials for individual phases. So now it's time to compute them. And I suggest three methods. <clears throat> In the tutorial, uh, you have exercises for each of these uh, three methods. The first one is called the bulk interconversion. And as you can see here, the idea is that you convert one phase into the, into the other. In this case, I'm showing liquid and solid. Um, the other method is biased coexistence, which is, a, in my opinion, a generalization of the idea of uh, interface pinning. And in this case, we have the two phases coexisting. And what we will do here is we will displace the interface such that the number of solid-like atoms uh, increases or decreases. And the last uh, uh, method that I will describe and that you will have in the tutorials is uh, thermodynamic integration. Okay, so let's start with uh, bulk interconversion. The theory is, I would say, relatively simple. The idea is that we will build a bias potential as a function of some collective variable S. And in this case, the collective variable will be the environment similarity more than that I have already uh, described. So it will be akin to the number of solid-like atoms in the simulation box. So we can compute the difference in free energy between these two phases in this way. Here we have one over beta, where beta is the inverse temperature, logarithm of the probability of uh, finding um, configurations that have a uh, value of the collective variable some um, larger than some threshold S star, divided by the probability of finding um, values of the collective variable less than some threshold S star. So this would be the probability of finding, say, solid configurations divided by the probability of finding liquid configurations. Okay, um, so this can be actually very uh, easily computed um, as I'm showing here. Here, H is the heavy side function. So essentially we're assigning a one to all uh, configurations that are liquid-like uh, and a zero to all other configurations. And we're doing the opposite for the other phase. Now, these ensemble averages defined here in terms of the uh, heaviside function um, can be computed through reweighting in the case uh, in which we have added the bias potential. 
I mean, if we don't have a bias potential, we don't see transitions. So all these equations don't, don't make any sense. So we have added the bias potential and we compute these uh, uh, ensemble averages uh, using a bias simulation. Um, and the equation that I've written here is the reweighting equation. So we have some weights W that in this case are uh, exponential of a beta bias potential. Here, the bias potential is denoted by V. Um, and this is, uh, this is how we're going to calculate uh, free energies. And when we divide the free energies by the uh, number of particles in the system, we have the chemical potentials. So that's the theory of uh, this method in a nutshell. Now I would like to uh, show an example of the um, things that one can do with these uh, uh, ideas. So if we do a simulation, say in this case of uh, IS1H, and we bias this uh, uh, collective variable, the number of ice-like molecules, uh, we will see trajectories like the one that I'm showing here, if we constructed a, a good uh, bias potential. And uh, this is shown for different temperatures, and you see that at high temperatures, it works really well. As we go to low temperatures, the simulations become harder, but still uh, they work reasonably well. So from these equations, one can compute the free energy surface that is not required directly to get the chemical potentials, but it's, I think, nice to see. What you see here is that we're actually simulating the nucleation process in which there is a very large uh, barrier. We have here the liquid and here the solid phase. Um, so using the equations that I described in the previous slide, we can compute the chemical potentials and the uh, finite, uh, uh, and study also the finite size effects. That's something that I would like to highlight. So the, um, if we study the chemical potentials as a function on, of uh, inverse system size, we see that there's a strong uh, dependence. So finite size effects are very important. Um, but we, we can yet extrapolate very well to the thermodynamic limit. Um, can I ask you a question, Pablo? Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, go ahead. Is, is the minimum at the, on the right side of the free energy not exactly at N? Yes, it's, it is not exactly at N. That's correct. And, and is it shifting with temperature? Or my eyes are, uh, it's likely it's shifting uh, is the same position. Yes, it's roughly the same position. It might uh, shift slightly with temperature. Um, and the, the rationale is that uh, um, the way in which we're defining the, uh, as what's ice-like ice, uh, ice uh, or liquid-like, it's uh, not perfect, uh, mainly because we have this switching function that, uh, uh, that is a mixing, let's say to some extent, uh, both, uh, uh, um, both, I mean, peaks of the distributions that we saw. So you don't expect it exactly then? Yes, yeah, so it's not, we could do it exactly if we have very good separation of the two uh, uh, distributions, and if we choose a strict threshold, which is not what I'm doing here. Okay, okay. thank you. In this case, you're, we, you would have the, minim, the minima exactly at zero and at n. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, yeah, for the stuff. By the way, feel free to, to ask more questions if you want to. Um, OK. We can also plot the, uh, this um, difference in free energy or chemical potential as a function of uh, temperature for the different system sizes. And we see how the uh, coexistence temperature is shifted for different uh, system sizes, a very clear sign of the finite size effects. And in black, I'm showing the extrapolation to the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so this is a, one of the methods that, uh, that, uh, that, I, that I'm proposing to, um, to work on on the tutorials. And the next method that I'm proposing is the biased uh, coexistence method. And the, as I described before here, we have the uh, liquid in, context with, in contact with the solid. It could be other phases. In this case, I'm considering those two. And the idea is to write the uh, Gibbs free energy uh, in the following way. We have the uh, chemical potential of the liquid times the number of liquid-like um, um, atoms plus the uh, chemical potential of ice uh, times the uh, number of ice-like atoms plus something that is connected to the, um, to the interface. Now, if we use uh, what they call the equimolar dividing surface, that is the fact that uh, we assign that all the molecules in the system, N, can be decomposed into 
ice-like and liquid-like. So we ascribe nothing to the surface. In, so if we do this approximation, well, it's not an approximation, it's a choice. Um, we end up with this expression for the, um, for the free energy. And um, what we can do is we can uh, evaluate the slope over a full layer of, uh, of uh, the solid that is um, that um, we're, we will try to form. And we arrive to uh, this expression. And here we have to make an important assumption that is that uh, if this uh, surface term is periodic over one layer, which makes sense, I mean, the formation of a layer um, it takes the system to a configuration that from the point of view of the interface is undistinguishable from the previous one, then we can uh, cancel out these uh, two terms. And we end up with a very simple uh, formula and idea that is that the slope of the free energy as a function of the number of um, ice-like molecules will give us the difference in chemical potential between the two phases that we're studying. And that's the, uh, the idea of, uh, of this method. This is similar, similar to, the, um, to the interface uh, pinning method uh, introduced by, uh, by Urs Pedersen. Uh, and what I'm describing here is a general generalization because in the case of interface pinning, they put a single um, umbrella potential that fixes the location of the interface. Um, what we will try to do is something slightly more complicated that is building a bias potential that uh, creates reversibly uh, a full layer such that we can neglect this uh, surface uh, term. But in, in order to, um, to do that, we'll have to uh, create a, a, a bias potential adaptively, for instance, using metadynamics or some other technique. Okay, so this is um, again uh, some uh, um, results for um, ICE 1H. What we're doing here is um, we're, we're uh, creating a bias potential that samples the number of ice-like molecules between two values. In this case, it's around 250 to uh, 320. Uh, that's essentially the formation of one, one full layer. We're doing this with four, uh, four multiple walkers. And once that the uh, simulations are uh, converged, what we can do is uh, we can compute the free energy as a function of the number of ice-like molecules for different temperatures. We clearly see here um, how the, um, the free energy profit profiles are quite linear and the slope changes very significantly with temperature. Um, when the slope is zero, that's the coexistence uh, temperature. We can plot the slopes that will be the chemical potentials as a function of temperature, and we obtain this uh, kind of uh, um, plot. Um, so this looks very good, but of course there are more uh, complicated cases. And I would like to highlight, for instance, uh, one of the uh, phases that we studied that is uh, um, ICE-6. Uh, and in this case, uh, one can see that the growth mechanism definitely uh, uh, interferes with the uh, expected linearity uh, of the free energy profile, um, but still uh, by average on, over one layer, uh, one should be able to, um, to remove this, uh, this effect. Okay, so this is the biased uh, coexistence uh, technique. Um, so both uh, techniques have their merits. Um, I made a sort of a list of the things that I think are good from each one. Um, I think they're and they're both very useful in to obtain the difference in chemical potentials between two phases. Uh, yet, uh, perhaps uh, the bias coexistence one is simpler in its application. So it's fast. It is, I've never seen uh, hysteresis in the collective variables. It is easy to work even with large systems. So you have very small finite size effects. The, um, perhaps the limitations is that the equation in which it is based is approximate. This is not true for the bulk interconversion for which the equations that I showed at the beginning of this talk are uh, valid. Um, so this is, um, um, I mean, those equations are uh, uh, exact. And um, in the case of bulk interconversion, there, there aren't any manually chosen uh, parameters because the essentially one have to, has to choose a threshold. Is this uh, uh, some threshold here to say what's liquid and what's solid? 
But the free energy barriers are so large that whatever you choose, even if you make a terrible choice, the, uh, the results uh, do not depend on that. Instead, in the, um, in the biased coexistence uh, uh, technique, um, the results depend somewhat on the choice of CV. As we saw for I6, the growth mechanism can also interfere in the calculation, which is a, a consideration. Now, I said that bulk interconversion is uh, in principle exact, uh, but um, the, it has more issues with the, from, um, uh, say, uh, um, technical point of view. So you can have a hysteresis, uh, you require longer simulation times because the process that you're studying in this case, that is the full interconversion of the phases is more complicated, but it's fairly easy for small systems and one can always extrapolate and the extrapolation is uh, typically very accurate. Okay, so that's the comparison between two of the techniques that, um, that I'm proposing to do in the exercises. They're both based on enhanced sampling, which is of course the, uh, the purpose of Bloom. So I hope you enjoy them. And now I'll go to um, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, uh, common techniques that is uh, thermodynamic integration. And this is another way to uh, calculate uh, the chemical potentials. Uh, here we have the chemical potential at some reference temperature T0. And provided that we have these, we will be able to compute the, um, the chemical potential or the difference in chemical potential at a difference temperature T just by integrating the difference in enthalpy between the phases. This is, of course, very cheap. Uh, the trick or the caveat is that um, we have to know already the solution at, at a different state point. So we, we have to know uh, at least that um, before we're able to use it. But if you do know the difference in chemical potential at uh, some temperature T0, it is a, a great method. Um, so here I'm showing an example of how the enthalpy as a function of temperature for two phases might look like. I'm proposing in the exercises in the exercise um, four that, that you do this. Um, and the last thing that I would like to mention uh, regarding these techniques is that um, um, an important complement of the techniques that I described before is the integration of the clausius clapeyron equation. And this is used to trace coexistence lines. So this is the, what I'm writing here is the clausius clapeyron equation that one can integrate, say, with the fourth order uh, runge kuta algorithm. And if you have one point uh, along the uh, coexistence line, then with this technique, you can easily build the whole coexistence line. So all the uh, four methods that I have just described complement in a way in which um, you can really study phase coexistence uh, accurately and, and efficiently. And the last thing that I would like to mention that is, um, it's uh, some calculations that are beyond, uh, say, liquid, solid, um, uh, chemical potential differences, because the ideas, I mean, the collective variable, the environment and similarity collective variable is, of course, more general. You can study other phenomena in crystalline solids, not just uh, chemical potential differences. And the application that I would like to highlight is the calculation of the interfacial free energy. And here, the idea is that. We have the liquid and we would like to form uh, a small slab of the solid. And uh, we can, of course, do that uh, by biasing the, uh, the, this collective variable. I'm showing here a movie for the, uh, um, the this is the prismatic uh, um, surface of, uh, of ice 1H. And you show that there are some fluctuations, but eventually you form a small slab uh, of ice 1H. And um, uh, this is how the simulation typically looks like. So you have that the collective variable uh, increases uh, and decreases, well, so forms the, uh, the interface in a reversible fashion. And uh, you can um, use um, an equation such as this one in order to uh, compute the free energy be difference between the liquid and the interface. And from that, one can easily compute the, uh, the interfacial free energy. An example of the... Uh, of other um, calculations that can be, can be done. Okay. 
Um, are there any questions? I, I hear something in the background. Okay, uh, so I'll move to the conclusions. So I described two methods based on a, on a handset sampling. One is the bulk interconversion method, and the other one is the biased coexistence method. These are both meant to calculate solid liquid chemical potential differences. I encourage you to do the calculations in the, um, that I'm proposing in the tutorial. Um, I have also introduced the environment similarity CV that can be used to drive, uh, in this case, the, the relevant processes. So the, um, in one case, the, uh, the uh, pool conversion into the crystal, and in the other case, just the formation of a layer. Uh, DCV is general in the sense that can be defined for any crystal structure. And I think this is an important uh, um, improvement over uh, previous attempts to, uh, to define collective variables for solids. It is non-rotational invariant, which will be important to uh, bias uh, the, the formation of the crystal that is well-oriented with the simulation box. Uh, as we have seen, it works well even for complex crystal structures, such as size 5 that had 28 uh, atoms in the unit cell. And I would say that the, the, the improvement in the quality of the CV um, allows uh, for an increased accuracy in these calculations. I hope you can see that in, in the tutorials. And the last version that, uh, that is now in a pull request in, uh, uh, in the Plume uh, GitHub repo allows for the specification of environments with multiple species. Uh, and this is also, uh, I think, a, a dramatic increase in the complexity of the crystal structures that one can study. Um, for instance, one can study ionic crystals with multiple species, um, uh, organic crystals. So I'm looking forward to see uh, the, um, how we can push in the direction of complexity. Um, and uh, as I said before, these methods, the, the ones that are based on enhanced sampling, are complemented very well by uh, other st standard techniques, such as uh, thermodynamic integration or the integration of the clausius clapeyron uh, equation to trace uh, coexistence lines. Uh, and with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoy uh, the hands-on tutorial if you decide uh, to do them. And um, if you have any questions, um, I would be happy to take them. And before going to that, uh, um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Max and Giovanni for uh, organizing this wonderful tutorial series and inviting me. And uh, many of, uh, I mean, I, the work that I have presented has been done, has been done with many collaborators, and these are uh, some of them. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pablo. So if there is any question from uh, participants. Uh, Thanks, Pablo, for a great talk. I have one very basic question that for systems like high entropy alloy, when there is different kind of species in the system, and due to that, there is a lot of disorder, local disorder in terms of environment. So if you give environment, you give like zero Kelvin relaxed environment, or I don't know, some prototype environment of BCC high entropy alloy. But during relaxation or during dynamics, that fluctuates a lot. So, what would you suggest to put higher cutoff or any recommendation on that kind of calculation? Hey, I'm not sure if I understood properly. You mentioned in the cases where you have a disorder, and uh, what, what type of disorder are you uh, are you thinking of? I I, I couldn't uh, hear you properly. I believe. So there are high entropy alloys which are like multi component mm -hmm. systems. So. Um, multi-component system in a same like BCC or FCC structure. But if you look at local environment in yes. terms of dis distances and arrangement, they are quite different. So again, the second nearest neighbor in BCC will be 14, but their relative distance will be significantly different due to the different atomic arrangement. So does that this method environment similarity consider that the change in length of the different neighbors over time. Um, and, okay, th thank you for your question. I'll try to uh, uh, to uh, to answer. I mean, to interpret your question in the uh, in the best possible way. Um, so, I think uh, if you are consider considering very complex structures such as a high entropy alloys. Um, um, uh, so assuming that you have 
uh, say, a perfect lattice, but you have chemical disorder, that is to say, you don't have uh, chemical species at regular positions, then uh, what you can do is just to neglect the fact that you have different species and allow the system to, um, um, I mean, you, you push it into form the correct lattice in space, but it assumes the chemical disorder that it wants to. So the chemical disorder is built in automatically. But in order for that to happen, you must assume that all uh, in the environment similarity collective variable, you have to assume that um, that all chemical species are identical. You can do that, it should work. Now, if you have disorder from the point of view of the structure itself, from the position of the, of the atoms, then that is something that is probably not suitable to study uh, in this context, because I mean, the, the definition of, the, of a crystal structure is the regularity. So that's what we're assuming. If you lose that regularity in any way, say if you, um, if you have an, uh, something that is uh, amorphous or that has grain boundaries, you would have uh, uh, many different environments. And uh, in that case, I would say, um, perhaps this is not uh, appropriate. Um, were you thinking of chemical disorder or structural disorder? Uh, actually, I'm thinking of both because when I, was, I worked on, in my PhD, I worked on this high entropy alloy system. And with high temperature, relaxation, or anything, the both changes. Even the chemical disorder is already present and where the structural variation happens. So I agree that lattice would be the same, that in BCC, we know there are eight first nearest neighbor or 14, including second nearest neighbor. But their relative distance as well as overlapping happens due to chemical disorder induced fluctuations in the system. Yes, chemical disorder, I would say, is not an issue. You just consider that yeah. all species are equal and you allow the system to choose whatever uh, type of uh, chemical disorder it wants to. This is very similar to what we do in ICE. ICE has protons. We're not considering protons. We let protons do whatever they want and they do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I guess there's a balance between uh, forcing the system to do whatever you want and in some uh, extent... Uh, um, uh, allow for some processes to take place uh, by themselves. By the way, thermal disorder is not an issue, of course. So you assume that the structures are perfect. And the fact, I mean, thermal disorder will come in by the um, spread of the distributions of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, uh, kernel, as we, we've seen. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Very interesting. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so if not, so we can meet again in one week. So if you want to subscribe to the Slack channel, use the link that I sent to the chat or you will just find it again on the Plumed Masterclass webpage. Thanks again to Pablo and see you next week. Can I add one more thing before finishing? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, does everybody know um, where the tutorial is on uh, this kind of thing? Um, I mean, that the fact that they can find it in the Bloom the website. Ah, uh, okay. So that's uh, usually we say that. Uh, and uh, okay. So maybe if you can go with your browser browser to the yes. So <clears throat> would be useful. We're going to do the tutorial. I uh, sorry. I what I want to do is um, okay. So we have the, um, the masterclass here. So you, you go to the Plume the, um, the documentation. There is a tutorials here, uh, Plume Masterclass 22.12. And this is the, um, the, uh, the tutorial I wrote. Uh, and uh, here in this, uh, you have a Git repository in which you have all the files that you will need to, uh, uh, to do the, uh, the simulations. And uh, I hopefully I, I I was careful enough to uh, to explain uh, uh, what you have uh, to do. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions. If you go to this repo, you also have the explanation there, uh, plus all the the required uh, input files. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. That's it for me. Okay, thanks a lot again, and bye bye to everyone. See you next week. Bye. Thanks for attending.